بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولاه Welcome back everyone to our discussion of a portrait of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم reading the book of Imam Tirmidhi الشمائل المحمدية So tonight we begin with chapter 41 the mid-morning ritual prayer Salat al-Duha Now Salat al-Duha is a sunnah prayer that takes place after the sun has risen and all the way before Dhuhr time. So that's that can be quite, in the summer, for example, when the day is long, it can be several hours. Or in the winter, you know, the span of the time can be uh, less than that. And it's a sunnah to pray the duha prayer during that time. So this chapter is dedicated to th- that portion or that sunnah prayer. So he says, radiallahu anhu, uh, hadith, he begins with hadith number 294. We have been told by Mahmoud ibn Ghailan, Abu Dawood, at Tayyalasi. I have an error in my book. Shu'aba told us that Yazid al Rishk said, I heard Mu'adha say, I said to say the Aish alayhi salam, did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam perform the, perform the mid morning ritual prayer, meaning Salat al Duha? She said, Yes four cycles and he used to add whatever Allah wished subhanahu wa ta'ala so he would pray two and two we have been told by Muhammad ibn al-Muthanna Hakim ibn Muawiyah al-Ziyadi told us Ziyad ibn Ubaidullah ibn al-Rabiya al-Ziyadi told us on the authority of Humaid al-Tawil that Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhum said the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to perform the mid-morning ritual prayer in six cycles so in one hadith, it was four rakahs, and in this hadith, it's six rakahs. And that's why there's a whole chapter to it, because we'll find different narrations of how many rakahs to pray. The minimum being two. If you just pray two rakahs during that time, then you have fulfilled the, uh, you know, the sunnah of the duha prayer. We have been told by Muhammad ibn al-Muthanna, Muhammad ibn Jafar told us, Shu'aba told us on the authority of Amr ibn Murrah that Abdul Rahman ibn Abi Layla said, no one informed me that he or she saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam performing the mid-afternoon ritual prayer except Umm Hanit. She related that Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam entered her house on the day of the conquest of Mecca. So he performed the major ritual ablution, meaning he made ghusl and glorified Allah in eight cycles. So he prayed eight rakahs. I never saw him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam perform a ritual prayer more briskly than that even though completing the bowing, the ruku, and the prostration. Now, the issue with this hadith is that there's another sunnah prayer when a city or a town or a battle is won. It's called the, the, the sunnah prayer of conquest, al-fatih. And most likely, this is what the Prophet ﷺ was doing here. It is eight rakahs. You can find it in the books of fiqh and in, in the seerah and whatnot. And Khalid ibn Walid, when he would win battle or you know conquest something, they would pray the sunnah, which is why there was a ghusl before it. So the common the people that comment on the on this book and this hadith, they point out that this particular hadith most likely is in reference to the, the another sunnah prayer. We've been told by Ibn Abi Umar Waqiyah told us uh, Kahmas ibn al-Hasan told us that Abdullah ibn Shaqiq said, I said to Aisha alayhi salam, was the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to performing the mid-afternoon ritual prayer? She said no, except when he was coming back from his absence. Hadith 298, we have been told by Ziyad ibn Ayyub al-Baghdadi, Muhammad ibn Rabia told us on the authority of Fudayl ibn Marzuq, on the authority of Atayya, that Ibn Abi Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu anhum ajma'in, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam would perform the mid-afternoon ritual prayer, salat al-duha, so often that we would say he does not omit it. And he would omit it so often that we would say he does not perform it, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that type of phraseology we will find in a couple of chapters when we talk about fasting, in the Prophet's fast, alayhi salatu wasallam. And this is the one of the indicators that an act is a sunnah, that the Prophet, alayhi salatu Alayhi salatu wasalam, would do something consistently so everyone would say, okay, he does this thing. And then he would stop it and he wouldn't do it consistently. And they're like, oh, I guess he's not going to go back to doing it. And that was a way of him teaching the people that this is a sunnah act. 
We have been told by Ahmed ibn Maniya, Hushayn told us, Ubaidah told us on the authority of Ibrahim, on the authority of Sahm ibn Munjab, on the authority of Qartha al Dabi. Sometimes the the transit al Dabi. Uh, on the authority of Qaza, on the authority of Qartha, that Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anhu, that the Prophet alayhi salatu salam used to devote himself to four cycles of ritual prayer at the time of the sun's high rising, which is just a translation for the duha prayer. I said, O Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi salam, you devote yourself to these four cycles at the time of the sun's high rising. He explained, now, now we have an explanation why the Prophet Sasan did this. He said that the gates of heaven are opened at the time of the sun's high rising. Then they are not locked until the midday ritual prayer is performed. So I love to have benefit arise for me during that time. I said, is there a Quranic recitation in each of them in the four cycles? He said, yes. I said, do they contain a separating salutation of peace? He said, no. And there are different madhahib of how the prayer is prayed. So excuse me for a second. Most of the people, most of the jurists say that you pray two, two, two. Some people, they allowed you to pray four straight. So they're just different madhahib. But this is not a class on fiqh, so we're not going to go into that. Hadith 300. We, uh, sorry, Ahmed ibn Maniya informed me. Uh, Abu Muawiyah told us, Ubaidah told us on the authority of Ibrahim, on the authority of Sahm ibn Munj Munjab. Minjab. Yeah, it's not Munjab, it's Minjab. On Sahm ibn Minjab. On the authority of Qaza, on the authority of Qartha, on the authority of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, radiallahu anhum, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said likewise. Another narration to the same text. Hadith 301, we have been told by Muhammad ibn al-Muthanna, Abu Dawood told us, Muhammad ibn Muslim, Ibn Abi al-Waddah told us on the authority of Abdul Karim al-Jazri, on the authority of Mujahid that Abdullah ibn Sa'id said, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa used to perform four cycles of ritual prayer after the sun's high rising before noon. And he said, it is a time in which the gates of heaven are open, so I love to have righteous deeds arise for me during it. So at this time, the gates of heaven are open, so it's an opportunity that you perform a good deed at that time so that, you know, you kind of, you start your day with that. So this is the illa. This is the reason why the Prophet alayhi salatu salam prayed this. And this is a great sunnah. It's a great sunnah that we should revive and it's so easy to do. And, and you know, as like I said, the minimum can be two rakas. Okay, and in the last hadith of this chapter, we have been told by Abu Salama, Yahya ibn Khalaf, Umar ibn... Ali al-Muqaddami told us on the authority of Mis'ar ibn Kadam, Kidam, on the authority of Abu Ishaq, on the authority of Asim ibn Damra, uh, Ali said that he used to perform four cycles of ritual prayer before noon, and he mentioned that the Prophet alayhi salatu salam used to perform them at the time of the sun's high rising, and he used to prolong them. Sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Okay, so this is the duha prayer. Chapter 42 voluntary ritual prayer salatu tatawa in the home so anything that's extra sunnah prayers it's only one hadith hadith 303 we have been told by abbas al ambari abd rahman ibn mahdi told us on the authority of muawiyah ibn salih on the authority of ala ibn harith on the authority of haram ibn muawiyah on the authority of his paternal uncle that abdullah ibn said said I asked Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam about the ritual prayer in my home and the ritual prayer in the mosque, meaning, you know, should I pray sunnah prayers at home or in the mosque? He said, you may notice how near my home is to the mosque because the Prophet sallallahu home where he's currently buried, alayhi salatu salam, is only, was only separated, you know, by a very, is a short distance between his home and his mosque. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, you, you may notice how near my home is to the mosque that I should pray in my home is dearer to me than that I should pray in the mosque, except in the case of the prescribed ritual prayer. Right? So the sunnah, other than uh, the, the fard prayer and the sunnahs that you would pray around the fard prayers, you know, immediately before, immediately after, etc. Any sunnah prayer, it's best to pray them at home. 
And there's a whole, you know, like host of reasons why, because the, the underlying idea behind it is that it is a pure form of worship because it involved, there's no showing off involved. There's no disturbing of people involved. It's something that you do on your own accord. Because the Prophet Sassan's prayer was uh, home was so close to the mosque, one would assume that even the Sunnah prayers before and after he would pray in his home and then just come out for the fud of the prayer. But in our case, where there are great distances, most likely the prayers before the Sunnah prayers before and after the fud of the prayers would also take place at the mosque, but anything else would be prayed at home. Uh, and uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken, in the Maliki Madhab, it is. Um, it is either recommended or it is encouraged that the tarawih prayer also be prayed at home. So the, the congregational tarawih prayer has an interesting evolution and fiqh behind it. We don't need to necessarily get into it now. We talked a little bit about that before. But because of this hadith of praying the sunnah prayers at home, not all of the fuqaha uh, were of the same opinion about gathering. Anyway. Okay, the next chapter is a little bit long, so we'll, we'll go through that chapter and then we'll conclude. And it's... Uh, Appropriate that we read this chapter because this is the chapter on the Prophet's fasting. There's no chapter on the Prophet's zakah because there is no zakah for the MBA. Um, because zakah is considered excess, um, almost like excess filth of one's wealth that needs to be purified. And then the Prophet, and all of the MBA, they have no filth, they have no uh, negative aspects to them. So they have no. Uh, they have no zakah, but rather the money and the uh, possessions and the, the resources that the Prophet ﷺ was given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was given, he was given discretion to use that and to spend that on the ummah as he saw fit. So we're not going to find a chapter on zakah, so we skip that, and now we have a chapter on fasting. Uh, chapter 43. We have been told by Qutayba ibn Sa'id, Hamad ibn Zaid told us on the authority of Ayyub that Abdullah ibn Shaqiq said, I asked Sayyidah Aisha alayhi salam about the fasting of Allah's Messenger alayhi salatu salam. She said he used to fast until we would say he has fasted. And he used to break fast until we would say he has broken fast. Just like the previous hadith about the prayer. She also said Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam did not fast for a whole month since he arrived in Medina with the exception of Ramadan. Of course, the marriage of the Prophet Sassam to Sayyidah Aisha takes place in, you know, in the Medina period. So she's not commenting on what happened in Mecca. Uh, we'll find some other hadith. But the Prophet Sassam, other than Ramadan, he did not fast a whole month. Uh, he fasted a lot of certain months, but never the whole month. Here, of course, we're talking about extra fast. Of course, he fasted Ramadan. We're talking about the Sunnah fasts. I should have mentioned that in the beginning. We have been told by... Uh, we have been told by Ali ibn Hujr. Ismail ibn Jafar told us on the authority of Humayd ibn, An uh, ibn Anas ibn Malik that he was asked about the fasting of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he said, he used to fast during the month of Ramadan until we would assume, uh, sorry, my, uh, <laughs> he used to fast during the month until we would assume that he did not intend to break fast during it. So he would start off the month fasting and, you know, day one, day two, seven, eight, they're like, oh, I guess he's going to fast the whole month. And he used to break fast until we would assume that he did not intend to fast during any of it. You would not wish to assume that he was performing the ritual prayer during the night unless you saw him performing the ritual prayer, nor that he was sleeping unless that you saw him sleeping. In other words, the fast and the tahajjud prayer, he would do it a lot and then he would leave it a lot. He would wake some of the night uh, and pray and sleep some of the night. He would fast some of the days and he would not fast some of the days. And that's the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Again, one of the reasons behind it is to teach us that it's a sunnah, not, not a fard. But in general, the theme, one of the themes that we're picking up so far is of the consistency of the Prophet. So he, was, he was consistent. Said Aisha said, Can Amalahu Dima that his actions were consistent all the time. So even though he did it and stopped to teach us, he himself, his natural disposition was to be consistent when he would do something. And that's really one of the great lessons I hope that we can take from this is the importance of being consistent in our ibadah. Hadith 306, we have been told by Mahmoud ibn Ghailan, Abu Dawood told us, Shaba told us. I heard Saeed ibn Jubair say that Ibn Abbas said. 
The Prophet ﷺ used to fast until we would say he would not break the fast during the month. And he used to break the fast until we would say he does not intend to fast during it. He did not fast for a whole month since he arrived in Medina with the exception of Ramadan. Now, of course, when, when the Prophet ﷺ came to Medina, he arrived, he left at the end of Safar. And then he arrived in Rabia, he arrived on his birthday in Rabi' al-Awwal, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That year, there was no Ramadan. The Ramadan, the fard of Ramadan would come in the following year. So also uh, remember that when we talk about the fast, the Ramadan fast from a, legisl- from a chronology point of view, it comes later. Hadith 307. We have been told by Muhammad ibn Bashar, Abd rahman ibn Mahdi told us on the authority of Sufyan, on the authority of Mansur, on the authority of Salim ibn Abil Jad, on the authority of Abu Salama, that Umm Salama said, I did not see the, the Prophet fast, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, for two consecutive months, except Sha'ban and Ramadan. Of course, not all of Sha'ban, but there are other hadith, which I think will come now, in which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fasted the most of Sha'ban. And in the fast of Sha'ban, there's a difference of opinions between the fuqaha. If you can fast after the 15th of Sha'ban and not. Some of the fuqaha say it's disliked to fast after the 15th, after the middle of the month. And some of the fuqaha say that it's okay. And the reason behind that is to differentiate between the sunnah fast and the oblig- obligatory fast, which is the month of Ramadan. I have never met a person who is so addicted to fasting that this is actually a ruling for them. I mean, most of us, if we fast one or two days, alhamdulillah. So, but it, 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 there are people I'm assuming out there at some point of time that would fast, you know, all of Rajab and all of Shaban and, and whatnot. Hadith 308, we have been told by Hanad. Abda told us on the authority of Muhammad ibn Urwa, Abu Salama told us that Sayyidah Aish alayhi salam said, I did not see Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam fasting in any month more than he was fasting for Allah's sake in the month of Shaban. He used to keep the fast through all but a little of Shaban. No, indeed, he used to keep fast through all of it. Of course, there has to be a differentiation. There are other hadith that talk about, uh, there has to be a distinction between Shaban and Ramadan, which is why the one day that we can't fast is the day of doubt, which is uh, the, the last day of the month of Sha'ban, uh, we don't fast because there's got to be a demarcation between not fasting and fasting. Hadith 309. We have been told by Al Qasim ibn Dinar, Abdullah ibn Musa, and Aliq ibn Ghannam told us on the authority of Sh- uh, uh, Shayban. On the authority of Asim, on the authority of Zar al Qubaysh, that Abdullah said, Allah's Messenger وسلم, used to fast at the beginning of every month for three days, and he would seldom break fast on Friday, the day of Jummah. Okay, so another explanation of how the Prophet وسلم, used to fast maybe in the beginning of the month. Of course, there are the three middle days of the month the 13th, the 14th, and the 15th of the lunar month, which are the middle days when the sun is the brightest, uh, sorry, when the moon is the fullest. There's also the Sunnah fast of Monday and Thursday. Uh, in addition, oh, that's going to come now. We've been told by Abu Hafs, Abdullah ibn Dawood told us on the authority of Thawr ibn Yazid, on the authority of Khalid ibn Madan, on the authority of Rabia al Jarshi, that Sayyidah Aisha alayhi salam said the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa was devotedly committed to keeping the fast of Monday and Thursday. Okay, so this is something that he did throughout. Hadith 311, we have been told by Mahmoud ibn Yahya, Abu Asim told us on the authority of Muhammad ibn Rifa'a, on the, on the authority of Suhail ibn Abi Salih, on the authority of his father that Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu said, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, works are reviewed on Mondays and Thursday, meaning by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I would like that my work be reviewed while I'm fasting. So here we have another indication why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fasted on Mondays and Thursdays. So now we're leaving the fast of the month of Shaban, and now there's some hadith about the fast on Monday and Thursday. We have uh, hadith 312. We have been told by Mahmoud ibn Ghailan, Abu Ahmad, and Muawiyah ibn Hisham told us, Sufyan told us on the authority of Mansur, on the authority of um, Khaythama, that Sayyidah Aisha alayhi salam said, 
The Prophet ﷺ used to fast on the Saturday of one month and on the Sunday and the Monday, as well as on the Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday of another month. So that's a little peculiar hadith, but that's another combination that he would do, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 313, we have been told by Abu Mus'ab al-Maydani, no, al-Midyani, on the authority of Malik ibn Anas, on the authority of Abu, Abu Nadr, on the authority of Abu Salama, Ibn Abdul Rahman that said Aisha alayhi salam said Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would not keep fast in any month more than his fast in the month of Sha'ban. We have been told by Mahmoud ibn Ghailan, Abu Dawood told us, Shaba told us that Yazid al Rishq said, I heard Mu'adha say, I said to Sayyidah Aisha, was Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to fasting three days out of every month? She said, Yes. I said, In which days did he keep his fast? She said he was not concerned about which days he spent fasting. So in this hadith, the sunnah is that he would want to fast three days out of every month. It could be the three middle days. It could be a Monday, Thursday, Monday. It could be Monday, Monday, Monday. You know, it's not important which the combination, but he tried to fast or he fasted three days of every month. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. According to Abu Isa, Yazid al-Rishq is Yazid uh, al-Dubai al-Basri, a reliable source on whose authority reports have been transmitted by Shaba, Abdul Warith ibn Sa'id, Hamad ibn uh, Zaid, Ismail ibn Ibrahim, and more than one of the Imams. He's also Yazid al-Qasim, and he is called al-Qassam. That's just extra. Okay. Actually, I don't even think that's in the Arabic text. Hadith 315, we have been told by Harun ibn Ishaq al-Hamadani. Abd ibn Sulaiman told us on the authority of Hisham ibn Urwa, on the authority of his father that Sayyidah Aisha alayhi salam said, Ashura was a day on which Quraysh used to fast in the pagan era. era. Ashura is the 10th of Muharram. So in this hadith, she's saying that Ashura was a day that the, the Jahili Arabs fasted because they committed some sin in the past and somebody said, oh, to expiate for your sin, you got to fast on the day of Ashura every year. And Allah's Messenger وسلم, used to keep its fast. Then when he arrived in Medina, he kept its fast and commended its observance. We know the story that the Prophet وسلم, came to Medina and he saw the Jews fasting on Ashura and he asked them why they're fasting. And they said that this is the day that Allah saved Moses. And the Israelites from Pharaoh, the Prophet وسلم, said, we have more of a right to Moses. So he ordered the companions to fast. Uh, so in the beginning, the fast of Ashura in Medina was an obligation before the revelation of the obligation for the fast of the month of Ramadan. So she says that when he arrived in Medina, Sallallahu Alaihi he kept its fast and commanded its observance. So then when Ramadan was decreed, the fast of Ramadan became the obligatory religious duty and Ashura was omitted, meaning it's no longer a fard, but just a sunnah. So if someone wishes, he keeps it and fasts, and if someone wishes it, he abstains from it meaning that it's a sunnah, but it's a strong fast, it's a strong sunnah, and as you guys know, I'm big on Ashura, and every year I try to, you know, excite people about the fast of Ashura, the meritorious uh, acts of, that we do in Ashura, uh, the fast of Ashura expiates the, the year before it, and that hadith is narrated on the day of Ashura, so we hear the hadith from our Mashaykh on that day, and they say, and we heard this hadith from our Sheikh on the day of Ashura, etc., etc. It's called Al Musalsal Ba Ashura. There's also the expansion that we've talked about before, um, you know, doing something extra for your family and yourself on the day of Ashura, the Ashura pudding that emerged as a way of implementing this hadith. And, you know, almost all Muslim cultures have this pudding, so on and so forth. So Ashura is a big is a big day that has many hadith. A lot of them are weak, but you know there are you know actually books written by the ulama on the day of Ashura. So even though it's a sunnah, it's, it's something that I highly recommend everyone does every year, inshallah. When we get there, we'll talk about it. Hadith 316. We have been told by Muhammad ibn Bashar, Abdul Rahman ibn Mahdi told us, Sufyan told us on the authority of Mansur, on the authority of Ibrahim, that al qama said, I asked Sayyidah Aisha alayhi salam, was Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam used to singling out any of the days, meaning for fasting? She said his work was perpetual. Kana amalahu dima. Okay, that's the, I, I quoted before. That's a very famous statement 
regarding the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, to the point that we should all memorize it, Kana Amaluhu Dima, that his actions were consistent. And I'm really big on this because I find most people's problems is just from simply from lack of consistency. His work was consistent. I like more than perpetual, but in the book it's translated perpetual. Which of you is capable of doing what Allah's Messenger Sallallahu used to be capable of doing? Okay, so you know maybe that's why people are not consistent because it's difficult. And the key to being consistent is not to do too much. So you you, you can't you can't have a perfect life in every single category. It's impossible. But you can take some categories that are important to you. Hopefully your ibeda, you know, is one of them. Okay, so I'm going to do one, two, three. That's it. And I'm going to just be consistent with it. That consistency is the sign of sainthood. That When we talk about the saints in Islam, the awliya, that's what a wali is. A wali is somebody who's just simply consistent in what they do. I We had a teacher... Um, not my teacher's teacher, uh, Al Hafiz Al Tijani, radiallahu anhu. He was a, a Tijani sheikh. He was Egyptian, and and uh, he was a Hafiz of Hadith, and he was a really pious guy. And uh, somebody, and maybe I shared this story, maybe with you or somebody else, but somebody told him uh, that, um, or he heard a rumor that the sugar factory in in Cairo somehow introduced some type of pork product into the supply chain and he wouldn't take any sugar. He wouldn't, he wouldn't drink tea with sugar or he wouldn't buy sugar or anything like that. And, and this was a false rumor. It turned out to be that it wasn't true that somebody you know, falsely mentioned this. So when, when his students informed the sheikh that, uh, oh, by the way, this is, it turns out not true. He's like, oh, okay, then the sugar is tahir and, and I, I was wrong. Okay, alhamdulillah. And they noticed that he still wouldn't take sugar. And they said to him, you know, you know, Maulena, why aren't you taking sugar? Don't you agree that it's it's pure? He's like, no, no, I agree, but this is something that I left for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm not going to go back to it. That's a sign of someone who's consistent. It's that's hard. I understand it's hard to be like that, but that's that's somebody who's committed to their worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anyway, just popped into my head. 317. We have been told by Harun ibn Ishaq, Abdul told us on the authority of Hisham ibn Urwa, on the authority of his father, that Sayyid Aisha alayhi salam said, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam entered my presence and there was a woman with me. So he said, who is this? I said, so and so who does not sleep at night. Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then said, incumbent upon you are the works of which you are capable. For by Allah, Allah will not become weary until you become weary. The dearest therefore to Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was that in which his companions would persevere, meaning that you can you can't go all out for everything, but to, it's another advocacy to be consistent. Three eighteen, we have been told by Abu Husham, Ibn Fudail told us on the authority of Al Amish that Abu Salah said, "I asked Sayyid Aisha and Umm Salama which work was dearest to Allah's Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam." They said that which was perpetual, even if it was rare. Madima alayhi wa in qal. Okay, again, and we know the other hadith, Khairul Amal Adwamuha wa in qal. The best of actions are those that are consistent, even if they are few. That's the key to consistency, is just picking up a couple of things and being consistent, consistent with it. And then not becoming bored, but say, okay, I've committed to I'm gonna fast this day every month. It's only one day. You might think it's a small thing, but if you commit to it and you do it every single month, khalas, it becomes part of you. That's going to raise your level with Allah Ta'ala in ways which you can't even begin to fathom. The last hadith, uh, 319. We have been told by Muhammad ibn Ismail, Abdullah ibn Salah told us, Muawiyah ibn Salah told me on the authority of Amr ibn Qais, that he heard Asim ibn Humayd say, I heard Urf ibn Malik say, when I was together with Allah's messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, one night, he cleaned his teeth, then performed the minor ablution, then performed the ritual prayer. I stood with him, so he began. He started with the Baqarah, and he would not pass by a verse referring to mercy without pausing and asking for mercy, nor would he pass by a verse referring to torment without pausing and seeking refuge from the torment. Uh, 
then he bowed down and remained bowing to the same extent as his standing upright. And he was saying in his posture, uh, glory to be the Lord of power, Jabarut, Al-Malakut, Kibriya, etc. Then he prostrated himself to the same extent as his bowing. And he was saying in his prostration, uh, glory be to the Lord of power, sovereignty, magnificent sublimity. Then he recited Surah Al-Amran, then Surah after Surah. And he was doing that in every cycle of the ritual prayer, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Imam, al -Naw, Imam uh, uh, at tirmidhi ends the chapter with a non-fasting hadith as it relates to the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, not only his continuity in his acts of worship, but the fact that he could do things that we can't do. In other words, the sahabas, of, who can pray that many, that long of a rak'ah or that long of a qiyam prayer? To emphasize the hadith that came before it, that Allah does not become weary until you become weary, meaning do what you can and that's enough, but be consistent in it. Wallahu ta'ala, ala wa alam. Okay. Questions, comments? Um, Bismillah. If we pray Salat al Duha, is it preferred? to make the intention that it is a sunnah or a nafl. There's no difference between sunnah and nafl. It, um, that's like a, uh, they're interchangeable in this context. So you just, you're, you're going to intend to pray the sunnah or the nafl of a duha. I mean, there's a technical difference, but in this case, it doesn't impact the niyyah. So you, both of them are the same for the purposes of the niyyah and praying. Which Ayah in the Quran refers to the duha prayer and how many are authentic, four or six. It's from the hadith, not from the Quran. But Allah Ta'ala swears by the time of a duha. A duha is a time period from after the sun rises to before Dhuhr. Well, duha wa layli idha saja ma wa da'aka rabbuka wa ma qala, etc. So Allah Ta'ala mentions the time of the duha, but the sunnah prayer of the duha is. Uh, uh, from the hadith and uh, Allah alam, but I believe six rakahs is the most authentic. Do we have to wait for the adhan for sunnah prayers at home? Uh, well, if if you want to pray the sunnah before dhuhr, for example, then you have to wait for the dhuhr prayer to come in. Yeah, which is why probably you you most likely will end up praying them in, in the in the mosque. I understand in America we follow 15 degrees for Fajr, but for those of us physically able, should we stop eating and drinking at 18 degrees as a precaution? <sighs> I don't want to create a fitna. Um, so I actually, I think I will decline to answer that question, <laughs> that question until after Ramadan. <clears throat> Tuesday, we have the Ask Tariq uh, session. So uh, we'll have an opportunity or I'll have an opportunity to review everyone's, you know, just people's random questions. It will be the last one before Ramadan. So if people don't feel like they have a lot of questions now, that's fine. Um, and then next Friday will be our last uh, Shama'il class before Ramadan. And uh, my guess is that we will... We will need three classes after Ramadan to complete the book. We have very little left, but I don't want to do too much each class. I just want to do this type of size of material. The best time for Doha prayer is after the sun rises completely till before dhuhr, any of those times. So whenever shuruq is, like let's say today shuruq was, or tomorrow, about 6.50, 6.53. So, you know, like from 7 a.m. to 1 p.m., basically, these like days, 
That's a long time. You can do duha prayer anytime during that time. Is it okay to get the COVID vaccine in Ramadan? Yes, because uh, a vaccine shot is intramuscular. Intramuscular shots do not invalidate the prayers, only uh, do not invalidate the fasting, only intravenous. The vein or the artery is considered in the fiqh part of the body cavity. So if you enter, a needle enters into it or fluid enters or exits, then that would break the fast. But intramuscular, like insulin shots, or in this case vaccines, that doesn't invalidate the fast. Can I brush my teeth with toothpaste during fasting? Yes, just make sure you don't swallow. Not that you would swallow the toothpaste anyway, but just don't swallow it. Okay, I'm, I'm thinking that there'll be a lot of questions for Tuesday. So if we do too many today, then we'll lose the opportunity. So we can bring all your questions uh, Tuesday. You can continue to email them, uh, same email address uh, that people have been used before. Uh, I get them like Tuesday afternoon. So I get a chance to just to look them over, look anything up that I need to. And then Tuesday night at 8 p.m., inshallah, we'll have the open Q&A. Next Friday will be the last Friday before Ramadan. And then khalas, you know, Ramadan kareem to everyone, inshallah. We ask Allah Ta'ala to bless us in these final days of Shaban and allow, allow us to arrive safely during the month of Ramadan. Pray that Allah Ta'ala uh, give us tawfiq in our fast, the barakah in our, in our fast. And Allah, we ask Allah Ta'ala to accept for um, us our fasting and our qiyam and our recitation of the Qur'an and to give us the ability to complete the recitation of the Qur'an. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshallah, to protect our children, to bless them, to protect them, to have mercy on our parents and to have rahmah and maghfirah for those who have passed before us, inshallah. Wa akhiru da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Allahumma salli afdal salatin ala as'adi makhluqatika sayyidina muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim adada ma'lumatika wa midada kalimatika kullama ذكرَكَ الذَّاكِرُونَ وَغَفَلَ عَنْ ذِكْرِهِ الْغَافِلُونَ والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I'll see everyone soon inshallah take care السلام عليكم